Hi, guys, and welcome to Millionaire Brand Creation. I am super excited to have a friend of mine, Elizabeth Smith, on. Elizabeth is the Managing Director of Oliver Smith Fine Jewelers, and you can probably see them now in Fashion Square, and you've seen them at Doubletree and Scottsdale Road. She's also in their Aspen store right now. Uh, I've known Elizabeth now for a little while, and we've bought some watches together, and I wanted to bring her on because I wanted you to understand her story, understand the female journey of entrepreneurship and how she has a great relationship with her father in the jewelry and watch business. And how she's taking the industry to the next level and what she's doing and kind of give us an insight on what the super luxury, uh, you know, ind individuals are doing in this space. So without further ado, Elizabeth, how are you this morning? Thanks for having me. Super excited. I'm good. Yeah, it's great to have you on. And I, and I know you went to the University of Oregon. You spent some time in San Francisco in the uh, alcohol business. What made you become an entrepreneur and what made you kind of transition to your family into the jewelry business? Good question. I think once I went away to college and then um, when I was straight out of college, I worked for a company called Gallo, which they're the largest alcohol producer in the world. And they have a fantastic sales training program. And I learned a lot from them. And then I went and worked for a tech startup. And my issue was always that I was in sales roles. So I was making commission off what I was doing. But even then, like any success I had went to the CEO or this business. And I like, didn't care. Like I wasn't motivated by it. Like I'm, I'm like busting my butt and it's just going to like benefit them in the long run. So I was always like thinking of little ideas. I lived in San Francisco, which is very like techie startup. So everyone's always like, Oh, I have an app idea and stuff like that. And then, um, my dad started our watch and jewelry business 42 years ago. And I never seriously considered it, but he had the opportunity to buy a business in Aspen and gave me a pretty good sales pitch to move to Aspen full time. And so it was kind of the right opportunity for me to have ownership of that. And then also get involved in, you know, a small business that I could have ownership in as well. But how did he transition into the business? I know at one time he had a store in Newport Beach. And then I know we spoke briefly, but obviously taking the jump into the luxury watch space and diamond space. I mean, really the ultra luxury high end of it. I'm sure everyone thought he was nuts and probably thought you were nuts for following. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that journey and talk about how you weathered the storm to become successful? Yeah, sure. So he actually got a very humble beginnings, grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania. Um, he, out of college, worked for a, as a blackjack dealer in Atlantic City. Mm. was trying to figure out what he wanted to do. And his sister was selling jewelry. Like We're talking like little silver chains and charms and like kind of cheaper stuff. And um, he would put fake gold and silver chains in his sock at work and sell them in the lunchroom to like other people who were working in the casino. Um, really built it up from there, eventually moved to Newport Beach, started to establish himself on Balboa Island. Um, but the issue there is when you get into the jewelry business, it's super relationship heavy because there's so much trust that goes into it. And California was pretty well established. So he started traveling to Arizona and saw an opportunity of the this new place, everyone's moving there, right? They need a dry cleaner, they need a school, and they need a jeweler. And so in about uh, the mid-1980s, he moved to Arizona and set up shop there and grew into the luxury space. He didn't start, you know, that high end, but eventually worked his way to where we are now. And how did that transition, you know, move to? Because obviously at that time, everyone knew what Rolex was, you know, Patek, I would assume, was coming online in the 70s. And so did AP and all those different things. But it's not the craze that it is today. How, how did that transition into kind of like the ultra fad now that everyone loves the space? Oh my gosh, watches in general? Oh, big question. Yeah, you know, for a long time, um, watches were kind of there. We didn't see the explosive explosivity on the second hand market that we do now. I really think that the second hand market has driven it. And I would say about 10 years ago, it started to become more socially acceptable to be wearing used watches. And to be honest, I think it was actually driven by the car industry because it became very okay to be buying used cars, to trade in, right? They had some sort of value, although we know cars can depreciate pretty quickly. There's some sort of value there. So why couldn't we do that with watches? And then as technology gets better, right? We can use the internet to look stuff up. We can have references. It just sort of snowballed into now there's this whole in luxury pre-owned industry, including jewelry, including bags, cars, and watches too. 
Yeah, it's interesting, especially in New York and L.A., Scottsdale's catching the trend, too. I noticed there's boutiques opening up that are really exclusive to, you know, the high end brands, right? Hermes, Birkin bags, diamonds that we talked about before the call, uh, Rolex, Patek, AP, Longa, all these uh, ultra high end brands that now are really carrying this weight because they're so hard to get. You know, how, how, how does someone become knowledgeable in this space? How do you start learning about it? And more importantly, how do you know what to invest in or not to invest in? Yeah, good question. So if you want to get into the watch world, I would just start to do some research. Like there's so many like uh, there's so many places you can go podcasts, YouTube, uh, trusted websites, etc. And really, you know, I would say be a you should be attracted to what you like. And even if you like something and you are concerned about price, you can buy it new or you could buy it on the secondary market. And those prices are going to be different based upon the brand and accessibility. But either one of those is going to be more price friendly for you. And now that that's more acceptable, it's a whole big world and there's lots of brands and there's lots of great brands. So I don't want to like, you know, discourage anything. You like what you like and then you can play with price based upon whether you buy new or pre-owned. Yeah. And it's an interesting world, especially because how do people become comfortable, you know, paying high five figures or six figures for a timepiece or and or a diamond? Like to me, you know, being young and being introduced into this space, I thought it was an unbelievable expense to pay something like that. And then once you get learned and obviously more knowledgeable, um, it becomes a lot more easy to pull the trigger on a very expensive item. How do you kind of get immersed in that space and start realizing price is just a place, you know, necessarily to place your money, not necessarily to be spent? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, it's definitely you can have a huge hobby in watches and jewelry. You have to appreciate nice things. And I think for someone to be, you know, we get the jokes all the time when especially it was in the Aspen store. Why do I need a watch? I have my Apple watch for sure. But then you don't understand the industry. So and that's fine. But if you're curious about it, you can be attracted to liking nice things. You can be attracted to the story of the brand. There's a ton of emotion that goes into jewelry and watches, whether it's the watch you inherited from grandpa on your graduation or your mom's diamond that got passed on to you. These are things that are created to last a really long time. So they become not only assets in that way, but there's a deep emotion connection to these things. You could also care about them because of design, how the way you dress, the craftsmanship, the time that goes into timepieces. I mean, there's so many things to care about. Um, but you were specifically asking about price and like getting more to the investment side, right? For watches. Well, the entrepreneurs and the real estate based people that watch yeah. this are always, no pun intended, curious to to invest in different spaces. In fact, when you were gone, a good friend of mine just came in and bought your Batman. And uh, one of the girls there says, you know, you should be on the payroll because you're so I love it. You should. You should. I said, hey, I'm ready. I'll do a trade deal for an AP or a Patek. But then you sold all the good ones. So the thing that's interesting, and I think a lot of the entrepreneurs listening in want to really further understand is how do you invest in the space? How do you understand the space? How do you become comfortable in the space, right? Because I think a lot of people, when they walk into a beautiful store like yours and there's champagne and there's coffee and there's people talking to you, if you're not comfortable in that space, obviously you feel uncomfortable, but how do you ingratiate yourself ask questions and become comfortable in learning about the process. Yeah. And that's what we really try to make our spaces super comfortable. I mean, we sell watches that are a thousand dollars and we sell watches that push close to a million dollars and we do everything in between. Okay. So you want to get into investing watches, two ways to approach this. Um, certain brands are holding value better long-term. Let's talk about Rolex for a second. Rolex is a brand. It's one of the top 10 recognized brands in the world that competes with Coca-Cola. They've done a fantastic job over the last 100 years of marketing. They were the first watch brand to get into sports marketing. So now you watch F1 golf, Rolex is everywhere, right? So they're the most well-known. They create the most watches. We think, we think they create about 1.2 million watches a year, but they don't tell us. But still, the demand is really high. So Rolex is going to be the first brand that most people gravitate towards. Great watch to check out. I would start with what is your price point? 
So say you have a $10,000 budget. Let's look at what's available to you new and then how those watches are playing on the pre-owned market for 10,000 and where you can like access there. Now, if you're interested in a brand and you notice they're not holding value as well in the pre-owned market, say they lose 30%, that's pretty normal, right? Um, especially in like the luxury space, that's fine. Say you, you really like that watch, then buy it pre-owned. Save yourself that 30%. Don't lose it right away. And you're always going to have money in that asset. It's an asset unless you, I don't know, throw it off a building and totally ruin it. But you know what I mean? If you take good care of it, um, there's there's going to be money there. Yeah, I know. And can you delve a little bit deeper? Because I know a lot of people, are, they, they, they understand Rolex, but what are some of the few other brands um, that they could jump into? What's the gradual next step after Rolex or maybe after that? Where, where, where do most collectors go? And then obviously, how does one use it as an asset class and or a branding opportunity to accentuate and meet people? Because that's one of the reasons I do it. Yeah, totally. Rolex is a great brand to get into. Um, Patek Philippe, you're going to hear about, makes fantastic watches. They hold really well in the resale market. High level of entry there as far as price point, right? So you've got to check that out. Um, AP, you mentioned, Audemars Piguet, we love, only makes a couple thousand watches a year. Definitely check them out. Also a high point of entry. And then you could get into the really specialty stuff, Vacheron, Richard Meal, um, really kind of high level. If you also are just interested in getting into the watch space for the first time, I would check out Cartier. They make amazing watches, um, especially for women and check out their prices. Some hold really well in the pre-owned market. And then those that don't, again, come in and just buy a pre-owned and then you are paying for what it's worth right away. Yeah, you've been in the space now for how long? About eight to 10 years? Me personally, I officially joined in 2018, but um, oh, okay. so I knew five. what painter I was when I was you know, 10. So <laughs> so five years in the space. And obviously, you've yeah. learned from your father and, and your family, and they've done extremely well in the space. What are some of the uh, things that you've learned? What are some of the tidbits, the behind the curtain scenes that you can share with the audience that they may not know about the jewelry industry? Sure. Yeah, we can flip to jewelry a little bit. Um, in like jewelry and diamonds specifically, there is this mentality that everyone like you are automatically going to get overcharged for something. Because back in the day before like the age of the internet, the markups on diamonds were pretty wild and you could negotiate a good price and they would start at a 300% markup because they knew they were going to work you down. Things have changed. Um, you can access, you can go online really easily and shop diamond prices, right? So we, our business has changed. We charge a really low markup on diamonds because it is so competitive. When it comes to jewelry, I, I don't think you need to go in on automatically thinking, oh my gosh, diamonds are overpriced and I'm getting screwed. It's not so much like that anymore. And it's really easy for you to, sh as a consumer to shop prices and do it, like come into our store. And if you want to buy a three carat diamond engagement ring, go to other stores and see how it compares. Like we're super open about it now. And anytime you don't feel like someone's being open or pressuring you in the situation, I would say that's a red flag. And talk a little bit about the diamond market. You mentioned uh, yeah. before we started, what's going on in the diamond market? And then for you know, the ladies, I would assume that are into diamonds a little bit more than the men some of the time. What are some of the things they should be looking for? Cuts, clarity, sizes. What are some of the things that over a long period of time hold value and what are you know more, more amenable to exchange if they need to? Yeah. So there's a big thing going on in the diamond industry right now, which are synthetic diamonds, which are man-made in a factory diamonds. If you follow the industry, you've heard about it. So big debate. What is interesting is that the synthetic diamond market already in a year has dropped by like hundreds of percentage points. So what's happening is these companies are starting to make these fake diamonds or synthetic diamonds. Um, and they were trying to hold them at the price point of a real diamond. Well, real diamond comes from the earth. It was made millions or billions of years ago, and it's super rare. And more and more people are creating synthetic. So the synthetic cost is dropping, but they want to charge as much as diamonds. So for an example, it was like a two carat synthetic stone, like a year ago, we could someone was trying to sell for $8,000. Now it's worth 600. From a diamond standpoint, I would not play in synthetics because I think it's going to keep crashing. And I can give you an example from uh, the Sapphire market in the 80s. That's what happened. But this is causing a little bit of a dip in the 
natural diamond market, especially under three carats. So in the one to two carat diamond space is down about 20 to 30% right now in value. Mm. Traditionally over the last 35 years, diamonds go up in value 3% every year. So it's a decent place to park an asset, right? You're not going to be making, it's not going to shoot up 40%. It's controlled, but you can wear something nice. You give it as a gift. You're still going to have some money there. My insider tip right now is if you wanted to buy a diamond under three carats or maybe a necklace or a bracelet with all half carats, now is a good time to buy because the price is down for the first time in a long time. And I don't think it'll stay. I think in a couple of years, it'll go back up to where it was. And also the watch prices are down too. I mean, it's unbelievable that some, a lot of these hard assets, cars, watches, diamonds that took off in 2021 and 2022. There's some good entry points now because of high interest rates. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the, the watch market went bananas during COVID, like a lot right. of things. <laughs> and um, it was great, but it got a little too crazy. There were some watches dealing at prices. We were like, this is not, this does not make sense to us. It has corrected, which is a good thing. Um, it has not crashed. We're not seeing pre-COVID prices, um, but it has adjusted a bit. So again, yeah, I think if you were keeping an eye, you're like, I want to buy my first Rolex, you know, it means a lot to me. Or I want to get more into it on the pre-owned market. Now would be a good time to check out those prices. So just for reference, like, obviously you sold me this one. So you know it, right? The Daytona, the black one. Yes. Um, can you describe this watch for the viewers and kind of talk about the investment aspect of a piece like this? Yeah. So the Rolex Daytona has become the most, I would don't get at me in the comments on this. The most <laughs> sought after Rolex. Um, it really became famous because Paul Newman used to wear one and his actual Daytona went to auction and got millions of dollars at auction. And that was the first time that a watch had done that at auction. It was like, holy crap, we need to be paying attention to vintage watches. This was like back like 2015-ish. So the Daytona became the poster child for watch investing. It's a great sports watch. It goes with everything. Rolex doesn't make a lot of them. It's not the most highly produced piece. Um, so people like to watch the Daytona price to see what's going on in the secondary market. The Daytona has corrected. I think the highest was probably March 2022. And it's corrected. It's not down to um, actual retail levels. It still trades higher on the pre-owned market. Um, and they continue to kind of discontinue the ones they're doing and come out with new ones, which is also a good investment play because of once it's discontinued, they're not making any more. Yeah. And that's kind of the game. I think that a lot of people don't necessarily understand, you know, it's interesting and I'm sure you'll get this in the comment sections after we post this on YouTube. But a lot of people ask, you know, why not buy a Breitling? Why not buy an Omega? Why not buy, you know, another great piece? And I've owned a lot of them and I'm sure you guys have too. And the yeah. truth is, it's just, they're, they're, they're too highly produced, right? There's just not as much of a resale demand for certain types of products. And it's all supply and demand, right? When you can't source mm -hmm. something and everyone wants the same thing to get it, obviously it has the ability to go up a lot more. Yep. Yep. So, yep. I mean, have you, have you seen, I mean, like, obviously this watch is an example where it retails for 14,000 and it, its height was 46, 47,000, right? Are there other examples of pieces like that, that if people want to enter the market at different price points that may happen again, as it happened in the past, are there certain pieces they should be looking for? The brand we really have our eye on in that if, you know, um, you're working with any sort of budget, I would go with um, an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, especially some some of the vintage pieces. The Royal Oak came out originally in the 70s um, into the 80s, and it's a steel sports watch made by AP. They only make a couple thousand watches a year, and they don't make a lot of Royal Oaks. And it's super hot right now, and everyone wants one, and they trade for way over value on the secondary market. However, you can go back and look at kind of the vintage pieces of the brand. I would say early 2000s, great price point right now, have not exploded like the modern day pieces. And I think they will, because what happens is someone wants the modern day piece, say the uh, 15500 of the Royal Oaks, a good example. You can't get it. It's reselling for a hundred grand, like whatever. So people will start to look at the older stuff. They'll look at the vintage. How can I get in it for maybe 28,000, 30,000, 50, right? So 
that's where I, if you were thinking about like a watch investment, I would go look at AP right now. I would look at some older pieces and I would check out two tone, which means it's yellow, gold and steel together. Cause are you wearing one right now? I am. I'm like, yeah. I'm preaching it. But <laughs> I recently got this. It's a early two thousands AP Royal Oak. It's a 34 millimeter two tone. Um, and it was like, it's still trading this watch. We just sold another one of them for about 28,000. Whereas some of their newer ones, you're getting close to six figures. So you can still play. It's a couple years older. You can find great pieces. I would just say, go to a dealer you trust because when you get into the vintage stuff, it can get a little bit more fishy. And how important is it to buy with box and papers? Uh, people don't necessarily you know, understand that construct. Can yeah. you explain that a little bit more? So the box and papers is the original paperwork and the original box that the watch came in. The older you get, the more older pieces, early 2000 vintages I'm talking, it's harder to get at that because people didn't save it because they didn't realize it was important. Generally, box and papers affect the price, the resale value of a watch by about 10%. It can be more, but that's a good level. So I would say if you are buying a watch that does not have original box and papers, that's fine, but you should be paying less than what the watch goes for with box and papers. I love that. And yeah. is there a piece of advice that you've learned in business so far being in the industry for five years that you could share with the audience? Something that was a takeaway that you're like, hmm, I didn't know that. Just in general? A generalization, yeah. You know, I think our biggest success comes from really once you get an idea and you feel good about it, jump in and move quick on it. Um, the perk of being an entrepreneur or even a small business like ours is that we move faster than our big competitors. So an example would be dur um, during COVID as crypto and Bitcoin started increasing, right? In one day, we downloaded Coinbase Commerce. We sent something out to our clients. Hey, we're accepting Bitcoin. And it was a huge driver of business for us, especially in Aspen, mm. where all these larger companies had to put all these regulations in place to get there, right? We also started during COVID right away. We were like, oh no, our people are at home. What? How are we going to connect with them? And we started holding auctions over Zoom. We didn't have to pay for big software, a big auction house to come in. We were like, hey, we're going to put 50 watches on sale. Let's do an auction. I know you've attended. It's now a really fun thing for us. And those were ideas where we're like, we got to act on this now. And that would be, you know, my biggest advice. You got a good idea. Go for it. We failed at stuff too. I'm just not mentioning them. I'm mentioning all the good stuff. But um, that would be my biggest advice, I think. Yeah. Success loves speed. You're right about that. And the other question I think a lot of the people listening in are wondering is how do you build a client base and how do you build a, a base in Aspen and Scottsdale and beyond that can attract and desire these pieces and more importantly, can afford them? Because I'm sure a lot of people watching this are looking to dabble in the same networks that we have. What are some advice that you can give them and some ways that they could possibly grow their business in the ultra luxury space? Yeah, you know, I have a big hand in our marketing and advertising. So that's where I that's where I automatically think too. I think we really try to be a trusted resource and educate first. So our number one driver of business right now is YouTube. Um, and we do YouTube watch reviews and talk about what's happening in the marketplace. And uh, when we first started YouTube, it was me filming on my iPhone, just like at a desk. And I was recently like, should we delete those videos or do they show where <laughs> they came from? But um, we've built it up. I think just providing yourself as a trusted resource. And then, you know, for us, I think from a sales side, we're really honest. We know what we're talking about, um, but we're also, you know, direct to the point. I think when you're pl pl playing at a luxury level, you need to be honest up front. You need to have all your details squared away. You've got one conversation you can have, right? Impress in that conversation. And then once you build that trust, you're in. Yeah, that's the truth. That's the truth. Um, is there, uh, you don't have any kids at this point, right? No. Okay, so here's a question. So for your unborn child, if you decide to have one with your husband, um, what piece of advice would you give them that you've learned so far in your life? Maybe a piece of advice that your dad gave you or something you learned from your mom, something that's a takeaway that as they grow up in this world could be a big benefit to them and their success. Yeah, you know, we are 
really big, and we'd say this with our whole team on following your gut. And I especially think for women, that is, we are taught to be nice do what we're told, um, follow the rules, right? And it can be really hard to break out of that feeling. But everyone knows, everyone's had an experience where their gut was saying, don't do this, but you still did it. And then what happened, happened, right? So I would say business personally, um, follow your gut. If something doesn't feel right, it isn't. Or if something feels like a path you should go on, jump on it. And the sooner you can harness that, the better. You'll just live a much more peaceful, happy life too. Love that. Love that. Uh, Is there a way or is there anything you want to leave us with or the audience and or how can they follow you? How can they get in touch with you? How can they do business with you and, and your team? Yeah, of course. So we're headquartered in Scottsdale. Um, we have stores in Ganey Ranch in Scottsdale. We just opened two new stores in Fashion Square. We're also in Aspen, Oliver Smith Jeweler um, on Instagram, YouTube, watches by Oliver Smith Jeweler. Um, you can follow me there too. I know you posted me, but um, we're happy. If you even just want to, you know, send me a message or our team like, hey, I like this watch. Is this a good price? What do you think about it? We really try to make ourselves available for that. It's a lot of what we do and we're happy to help. And I love getting people into their first watch or their first piece that they're excited about. So however we can be a resource, we're happy to be. Well, I love that. Thank you so much for taking the time, Elizabeth. And uh, I can't wait for everyone to look at this. It's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Michael. Have a great day. Take care. Okay, bye. See ya.